Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this incredibly gorgeous day in Washington. I want to first say on behalf of all of my colleagues in the administration what an incredible honor it is for us to be with you. Uh, you are the people who are out there making innovation in clean energy, making manufacturing, creating jobs in America, and helping to move us toward fulfillment of the President's goal, which is that America should lead the world in clean energy. A country that leads the world in clean energy development and manufacturing simply will lead the world. And that's our objective. It's a fight, it's a race, and it's one we have to win. So good morning and welcome to Washington. Uh, I'm Gil Sperling. I'm with the Department of Energy. Uh, we work with most of you in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy where I am. What we're going to do this morning is we'll have a couple of uh, brief remarks from some of my colleagues in the administration. Uh, but the important part of this morning is really for you to tell your stories about what you are doing and to engage in, uh, in as much dialogue and discussion we can about how we take what has started and reach that goal line that the President has set. So without further ado, I want to introduce first uh, John Fernandez, who is the Assistant Secretary of Commerce. More important, he is the uh, person who leads the, the, the country's Economic Development Administration which really is in the forefront of job creation and innovation, uh, working with the private sector and growing the economy. Uh, John comes to us with a tremendous background in the private sector and executive leadership, and um, he also has a little bit of experience in the political world, having served as mayor of Bloomington, Indiana, for seven years, uh, where he was, well, he was incredibly successful in terms of generating investment and jobs. So, John. Great. Thank you uh, so much. It's, it's great to be here with so many um, folks who are actually helping us uh, build a stronger economy, my colleagues from the Federal uh, Service. It's great to be with them as well. i got to say, you know, the last time John and I were on a panel together, um, uh, it was actually in front of a congressional committee. <laughs> and, uh, this is a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> with all due respect to Congressman, uh, I hope this crowd's a little bit easier uh, than uh, that one. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, the point today is really for us to engage in a, uh, I think, a robust conversation about uh, some of the work we're doing, but also, more importantly, you know, how our work can better uh, support uh, the advances you all are doing in, with your own businesses and in your own communities. Um, you know, there's so many people here that I don't need to uh, harp on uh, the relevance and importance of manufacturing uh, to the core economy of the United States, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will weigh in on that as well. But I do want to uh, emphasize that uh, this administration gets that and is very focused on how we can build the kind of innovation ecosystems that can support continued advancements in manufacturing to create the kind of jobs that have always historically played a huge part in building a middle class and, and leading, uh, helping lead uh, the global uh, innovation agenda with our uh, strong companies, with their ingenuity and probably high productivity. So others I know will talk about that. We do at the Department of Commerce now have a, a new secretary, uh, John Bryson, who uh, this is, I believe, his second full week on the job. But I can tell you, ramping up to his uh, formal confirmation and then subsequent to his confirmation, uh, he has talked uh, just almost exclusively about what are we doing <coughs> as a department and as an administration uh, to focus on this issue of uh, competitiveness and competitive uh, manufacturing. Uh, so uh, this administration certainly wants to continue in that vein. You know, our agency, as, as mentioned, really does focus solely on the notion of uh, regional uh, competitiveness, uh, trying to drive the bottom-up strategies uh, for a sustained growth. And we do that really in, in working in strong uh, co-investment co role uh, with public-private partnerships that are developing their strategies uh, that are locally owned, locally developed, and uh, driven. And we try to make smart co-investments to accelerate their work. Uh, a good example might be the work we did with um, folks in the Midwest on the National uh, Digital Engineering and Manufacturing Consortium. This was a uh, partnership uh, with uh, our agency, uh, OSTP, uh, but most importantly with GE, John Deere, some other major manufacturing, the Ohio uh, Supercomputing Center, to build um, you know, some new products that actually can drive high-speed computing, modeling, simulation, 
into their small and medium sized uh, supply network uh, so that their suppliers can become even more globally competitive to support uh, the, the, the broader uh, agenda of, of that entire manufacturing group in the Midwest. And you know, there are other examples through some of our interagency work uh, driving these jobs and innovation uh, partnerships that I think we can get into as we uh, have the conversation throughout the morning. But again, I think you know our goal here is to emphasize the uh, the relevance to the work you're doing, to the work we're trying to do to drive an innovation agenda, support uh, advances in manufacturing competitiveness, and most importantly, to uh, continually create well-paying, sustainable jobs for uh, the American people. And uh, we'll get into that some more as we have this conversation. But I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of you and getting your feedback and some insights to how we can do our jobs better. So thank you. Thank you, John. I'm going to turn it over to our uh, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Transportation. And the uh, Department of Transportation is a close partner uh, of the Department of Energy in efforts to reduce our dependence on <coughs> foreign oil, to uh, create jobs and modernize our infrastructure, whether it's from high-speed rail to advance highway technology. So, John, thank you. Uh, thanks, Gil. It's great to be here this morning. This is uh, uh, really a core mission of the Obama administration. And I want to uh, talk for a moment about transportation and, and the Buy America requirements and how we're using it to drive opportunities in American manufacturing. Uh, this is, uh, first, we put tens of billions of dollars of work out on the street every year in transportation projects through our state and local partners, maybe highway, transit, aviation, uh, rail, uh, or other projects. In the past, uh, what our are called the Buy America requirements, which range from 60 percent for transit to 100 percent for high-speed rail. Those have been honored in the breach. Uh, we have a department that in the past used to routinely issue waivers uh, to allow non-U.S. products to be substituted for U.S. products. Uh, philosophically, that's something that we think doesn't make much sense at all. We are committed to recycling every one of those hard-earned tax dollars here in America for American manufacturers through the entire supply chain. Um, and we've done it basically by just saying no. We don't grant waivers. Um, and uh, in the two years uh, of the Obama administration, uh, the two and a half years that we have been working on this, we've gone from routinely granting waivers to having very, very few. And, and let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, we are uh, working with our partners at the Department of Commerce, uh, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which represents thousands of manufacturers around America. Uh, we signed an agreement with them to use them as our scouting network. So uh, when someone comes in with a wheel bearing or a nut or a bolt or, or rebar uh, and says it's not made in America, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership is, is talking to all of their manufacturing clients throughout the United States to find that American manufacturer. We're also telling our state and local partners design those projects in the first place for American products. You know, this is not rocket science. Um, uh, if given the chance, we do this better than anybody in the world. And um, we have a great partner here in uh, Chandra Brown in United Streetcar, uh, where uh, she's very much committed to uh, U.S. components uh, in their streetcars. And one recent example, the rails that uh, our uh, light rails and streetcar vehicles ride on were not made in America. I mean, that's incredible. This is a country that, that can build anything that it puts its mind to. Um, and waivers were, were routinely granted. And without getting too technical, uh, we went from uh, what was called girder rail to a, an equivalent product called block rail uh, that's actually made in Steelton, Pennsylvania, uh, by Arcelor Middle Steel. Um, and so we've completely changed the discussion from getting a waiver to you show us why this American-made product, this block rail, can't work. And that's the barrier that, that you have to cross. Um, uh, and again, backing up in the design process, we're at the point where uh, we're encouraging, uh, strongly encouraging our state and local partners to design projects from the beginning to maximize the U.S. manufacturing uh, 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 percentage in there. Um, and knowing that they're not going to get waivers from the Buy America requirements has changed the discussion entirely. This is an administration that's going to maximize that throughout the entire value chain. Components, components, <coughs> final assembly. So we're very excited about this, and this is something that we are uh, utterly committed to. John, thank you, and uh, thank you for the work you're doing. 
This is fun for me, uh, you know, someone who's been around Washington for a while but, and a lawyer. I get to work for a Nobel Prize winning scientist in Dr. Stephen Chu, who uh, you couldn't have a better boss and he does extend his welcome to you. Um, but for, for all of the, the scientific brilliance, the, the man now on my left matches that with enthusiasm. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and, oh man. And just an outgoing <laughs> capability that, that uh, everybody loves working with him. And, and he is our chief technology officer. And uh, talk about innovation. Actually. All right. Well, thank you so much, Gil. Well, and really, a celebration for all of you. Uh, you're the reason why I have my job. Uh, the president, on his first full day in office, introduced the idea of having a chief technology officer, and his instructions were that we want to tap into the expertise of the American people to solve our biggest problems. And he challenged me to come up with recommendations on how our government could be more open. Specifically, he said, how do we make data more accessible? How do we promote more participation so that you can help have a voice in the rules and decisions that affect you? And how can we better collaborate so that we can actually invent the solutions to the challenges that we face together. Uh, and this no notion of bottom-up change and the power of this uh, Champions of Change concept in general is that we're finding people we just hadn't known under normal circumstances. You don't normally show up at government RFPs or random you know, uh, lobbyist parties or all these things. You're part of the, uh, the good people across the country who are actually taking uh, the potential opportunities and translating them to jobs and economic growth for the American people. I have the honor and privilege of supporting an effort we're calling Open Innovation that rests on the following very basic principles. It's all around the spirit of the uh, government's role as impatient convener. Uh, I was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Virginian. I was in the Virginia cabinet. We're a commonwealth, not a state. I didn't quite understand the appreciation for that. But Jamestown was our birthplace of democracy over 400 years ago, and the queen came to visit to celebrate, and she reminded us that uh, Commonwealth was really about folks coming together for the advancement of our greater common good. And that role of inpatient convener is really a lot about this, this open innovation movement. And it starts with data. There are, uh, d uh, there's information that we have in Washington sitting in file cabinets, written in reports that you never read, that actually could help you be more productive and effective as a business. For example, John's working on a database right now of excess manufacturing capacity in the Midwest. And we're working to find ways to liberate that data so that there can be much more of a competitive and open marketplace. Hey, maybe we could bid on that job over two weeks because there's some capacity here we can take advantage of and bring costs down to be more nimble and effective. So we would love to have your input about the data sets that we have in Washington that we should be making more accessible because, hey, we as taxpayers paid for them. It's meant for you, so let's get into you in your hands so you can, you can build products and services of the future. Second. It's about the notion of challenges, prizes, and contests to bring your expertise to solve uh, you know, the big problems that confront us without the burdens of the 9,000 pages of RFP, triplicate forms times 10. Literally, an idea and a sheet of paper can win you a challenge or a prize or a contest. We're in the middle of one right now, apps for entrepreneurs. If you visit challenge.gov, we're literally saying, hey, look, we've got all this data on procurement opportunities, grant opportunities, you name it. And the Small Business Administration put a little... Uh, us in tech nerd land say, you know, a programming interface on it, help us translate government data in grants and opportunities so that regular folks can find out about them without knowing all the who to call or whatever. And we hope over the course of the next two weeks, there'll be better tools in your hands now so that you can access these opportunities as they, as they arise. So increasing the use of challenges, prizes, and contests. By the way, the Energy Department, I had the pleasure of visiting with some folks, they had an XPRIZE partnership to get a car that can achieve 100 mile per gallon performance. It was built in Lynchburg, Virginia. Last I checked, that was not the center of the American automotive universe. <laughs> Yet it was in Lynchburg where the creativity, these guys that were doing, uh, not NASCAR, but the you know, IndyCar kind of things, were tinkering and, and, and played around with a vehicle that actually could achieve that very, very high milestone. But last and certainly <coughs> not least, it's about this public-private collaboration. Not everything is government data. It's also about uh, a, a collaboration with the private sector. So John mentioned we have this um, modeling and simulation collaboration. Very modest investment in the government. But what it's opened up is a discussion. Procter & Gamble on day one said, you know what, we have this simulation uh, called Open Foam that's helped us be more productive and efficient as a multi-gajillion dollar company. We'll donate that as an open source tool through a website called manufacturinghub.org. 
that will be freely available to all of you so that you can repurpose that information and bring down the cost so that you can take advantage of basically advanced tools to increase your new product development. And it is that notion. NASA's contributed uh, models, Procter & Gamble and others, and we haven't even officially launched the final results yet, but small businesses are saying, hey, I'm going to Manufacturing Hub, I'm getting folks to help me, and I'm increasing my product development cycle because these tools are more accessible for me. Finally, it's about Dale. Uh, I, love Dale I love all of you, but I know Dale. Dale is all about finding that tinkering spirit of America. These folks aren't what you would consider to be the traditional manufacturers of the country, yet they're just playing. And what they're doing is phenomenal and inspiring. They're taking multi-jillion dollar projects and they're turning into a hundred dollar, you know, hacker little ideas. And those are the things that can scale. That's how Steve Jobs with the Home Brew Club got the computers going in, in the Apple II and the Apple I. So that's the spirit of this. Uh, in this conversation, you're going to tell us things that we should be doing to fix our regulatory problems or our budget issues, but you're also going to tell us ways we can collaborate in the spirit of open innovation. And you will have me at hello. We're going to get things done, and we'll measure success, I hope, in 90 days. With that, Gil, let's Thank rock you, and roll. Anish. Terrific. Uh, we want to engage you in a dialogue now and, and talk. As you can see, I think, from, from all of us, uh, you hear a lot of bad things about Washington. <coughs> Uh, it's a little bit frustrating for us because we honestly feel that we're doing things differently. We're reaching out in a partnership in a way you haven't seen before. This is not the federal government picking winners and losers or dictating. This is the federal government trying to work, state and local governments, and trying to work, particularly with you in the private sector, to bring innovation and entrepreneurship to where it ought to be, to restore our competitiveness and our leadership in the world. And you represent that kind of success and understand well what the right working relationship should be. So that we want to talk a little bit about that today. I want to, I want to kick this off with a question over to John Haworth, uh, uh, only because I am from DOE. We have a major solid state lighting program that we'll talk about later. And Lighting Sciences Group is just, uh, just at the top in terms of, of what they're doing. And I'm going to ask John to talk a little bit about it. But uh, two years ago, they had less than uh, 50 employees. You know, today, uh, about 300 here in the U.S., about 1,000 overall, uh, focused on R&D, product design. Uh, they are leading the world in terms uh, of solid-state LED lighting. And, uh, you know, John, my, my question specifically for you is, you know, what's your long-term vision for domestic manufacturing in the U.S.? And, and, and if you can talk a little bit about your partnerships with uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, and others. Even brought props. Yep. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, LED certainly is the future of lighting. I don't think there's any dispute over that. And we've really, at Lighting Science in Florida, have had an advantage. Um, as the NASA program has wound down, we've been able to, with our close proximity to the Kennedy Space Center and all of the support operations that has, have supported the shuttle program, we've been able to have access to the top scientists in the world, uh, thermal engineers, optical engineers. And we've been able, it's truly an American dream at Lighting Science, we've been able to lead a traditional industry of giants in lighting and start, start a business and grow rapidly. We've recently uh, announced that uh, we've, we've crossed the $100 million mark in orders uh, for, for 2011. And our focus is to continue to push the envelope continue to drive, continue to look for innovations to take a lamp like this, which uses 80% of the energy of a traditional incandescent lamp, and push it beyond, beyond the limits that we know today, to keep looking for better, better ways to do it, to become more energy efficient and less, less dependent on foreign energy. We've been able to, um, to grow the business uh, sig significantly over uh, over the last couple of years, and, and where you can help us is the education. On the commercial side of the business, people get it, people get the savings, and using 80 percent less energy is, is certainly a, an appealing savings. On the residential side of the business with products that you see through Home Depot, it's a little tougher sell. It's a tougher sell because the word, the word isn't out there yet. But the government is a large user of energy, the largest user of energy. So our government helping us, putting programs in place to convert buildings like this, convert capital <coughs> to LED, all of the government offices will really help a business like Lighting Science continue to grow and continue to sustain the, the 
the, the hyper growth that we've done and keep those jobs, keep those technology jobs, those high paying jobs in America. Great, thanks. And, and I want to encourage all of you to sort of chime in, because uh, this is intended to be a, a, a dialogue, not a question and answer, and, and we should be doing the least amount of talking. Uh, Alex, I'd like to turn to you and ask you the same question in terms of your vision of the future. Uh, Nelson Kellerman is, is uh, designs, manufactures, and distributes, uh, how do we describe it, sort of rugged, waterproof, environmental, uh, sports performance instruments, uh, and you've got a great track record in terms of growth and the market. So, you know, where do you see this going and, and what can we do? So, we make products that are people looking at them would more traditionally expect them to be made in China. They're small, handheld electronic products. It's a printed circuit board, it's a display, it's what we think of as being made in China. We've made them in the United States for 30 years. Um, and we're, we do it for a lot of reasons. We're competitive doing it. We have a very, what's, what's known as a um, high variability, low volume mix of products. We have lots and lots of variations of products and there's many things we only make, 500 of a year, 1,000 of a year. Sourcing that in China would just not be effective. So for us, it's 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 a business-driven decision, but it's also a philosophical one. Um, we're going to keep doing it. We keep making new products. Um, we focus on having a very diverse <coughs> customer base and being very quick to respond to uh, making new products for our customers. Um, a couple things that have already been touched on. Um, I want to give a shout out to the MEPs and to the continued partnership of the MEPs. Um, we are very committed to lean manufacturing. We use lean principles absolutely everywhere in our plant. We're lean new product development, lean accounting, lean manufacturing, lean people development, um, and all of that we've learned with the help of our local MEP, which is Delaware Valley Industrial Resource Council, um, as a way to help find and put forward manufacturers with abilities. That's a tremendous opportunity for them. Um, our MEP has a proposal right now to be a clearinghouse for loans to very small companies, 250 employees or fewer, that right now are really challenged with getting money for research and development. Um, and, you know, I love solid state lighting and I love the focus on solid state lighting. I don't get too tunnel vision. You know, in our local southeastern Pennsylvania area and my CEO group. We've got valve manufacturers and box makers and lots of different kinds of manufacturing. And if you get, if we get two tunnel vision on um, particular agenda items, we're going to forget that there's a lot of there's a lot of manufacturing that is going on that needs help as well. Um, and getting better at it. I personally believe lean is a great tool to do it, but. Um, there are a lot of different approaches to improving how we manufacture things. And the one thing that's absolutely true <coughs> is no amount of Buy America will hold water if we don't keep getting better at manufacturing so that we're spending money effectively. And that's information training. Um, you know, right now, pretty much all of Pennsylvania's training money for next year got cut. Um, we've used a ton of um, state provided assistance, which was funneled federal money to provide training for our people. Every one of our people has gotten training in manufacturing principles, and we have no money available to do it next year. We'll still do it because we believe in it, but um, it's a great way to continue making manufacturing get better. That's great. Lean is about continuous improvement. You never stop getting better. That's great. I, uh, so can I just take a quick sure, yeah. I want to just react. So one of the challenges that we face in a budget-constrained environment is the need to push productivity improvement. So when we think of training as a noun, that is a dollar equals a human being standing in front of a class to educate them on why the cost per enrolled student is a dollar figure that has pretty much been stagnant or going up pretty much forever. But the innovation piece is I hope an opportunity, and it would be phenomenal to get some of the folks to engage a little bit on this. About maybe a month ago, the Department of Labor announced a $500 million grant, uh, grants to community colleges in every state in America to provide online course development support that can be freely reused by anybody. 
The uh, projects are all available on the website to see which community colleges in your state or neighboring states, or frankly, because it's online, it could be anywhere in the country, happen to have put forward a course development plan that relates to the things that are important to your industry. Because the marginal cost to improve the open training resources and make them a little bit more custom for you might be 10 to 15 percent of the cost if you otherwise had to do a dedicated and pure play training program. So what I'd love to do in an environment where we would love to say, let's get more money for training, and I think we'll hear that message. I also want to suggest that there's another path, which is how can we engage to ensure that the sort of next model of training in the country, perhaps the more productive in the sense that lower cost, uh, higher, higher uh, uh, impact, because you've basically standardized a good deal of it, maybe there's a chance to work together in the positive end to make good with what we've got as much as we want to fight for these priorities. And so, did anyone here know we have available community college training, uh, $500 million grants to build courses for you? Can anybody show a single hand <coughs> if you heard about this? Okay, so this is clearly problem number one. <laughs> Every single one of you are within some range of a, of a, of a physical community college that's yeah. gotten the money or a network of community colleges that could support you. And the best part it is, the community college presidents who are receiving these grants are like salivating to have small businesses walk into their office, their, their schools and say, help us design the curriculum so it meets your needs as well. And I can assure you from every community college president I've met, and Gil and John and others, John, you can tell me, they are like all over uh, collaboration with, 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 with business leaders. And so maybe a to-do item on our end is to make sure you know exactly who to call today on this training question. Anybody else want to weigh in on some of the training issues and some of the things that you're doing and, and uh, how that how that you're addressing that? Is that a problem? Is that something that you foresee? Because this, I think Anisha has it right in terms of improving productivity. It, it, it is a budget constrained world and we have to recognize that. So if anybody else wants to jump in, otherwise I can. Let me just say this real quick. Um, the, I think that the uh, the the focus of the of the administration on building out on manufacturing is absolutely correct. And part of the, what we've seen in the recovery is the leading edge of it has been manufacturing jobs. A lot of our um, we talk about the lack of knowledge. You know, a lot of people don't know that we lead the world in manufacturing. Yes, sir. And we are, we need to, as a country, work harder at this. So I want to thank you for what you're doing. I think that not only is trading important, but technology transfer issues are important. We have a lot of capacity in the Department of Energy, through our federal labs and other departments, uh, commerce, through NIST, and so on. Uh, so what we're trying to do with MEP is very, very important to provide hands-on help, but also we need to tie to that the tentacles into um, the places in the government where we can help small manufacturers uh, with some of their technological challenges. So one of the things that you know, when we talk about innovation is to use the technology to be able to connect up individual entrepreneurs with help that they can, they can, that, that can actualize uh, an ability to help them solve real present day problems uh, in their plants. Uh, so I just think, I think that we're headed in the right direction. The training is important. I met with the local manufacturers and every single one of them talked about the need for skilled workers the lack of skilled workers, the need for training, uh, which is an amazing thought when you think that, well, there's still a number of people who are out of work in our country, but we have to understand that in manufacturing, there really is a, a need for a trained workforce uh, to be able to, uh, you know, to meet the uh, productivity that's required uh, for these manufacturers to be successful. So I think the community college issue is critically important. That grant and, and tying that together with MEP and making sure that manufacturers know how that works right, is you. where we need to go. Thank no, you. Great. Thank you. Sure. So, so there, another kind of training or education that I think is really important is training young people to be entrepreneurs, yes, sir. especially technology entrepreneurs. And at the University of Maryland and my institute, MTech, yes, we offered 30 courses <clears throat> each year in entrepreneurship. We train students all the way from eighth grade through graduate school. And typically about 1,200 students per year uh, take these courses and learn the processes and practices associated with entrepreneurship. And I think that's really one of the important things that for the future of our country is to get these kids really early. It's never too early to start, really. <coughs> get them involved in learning how to be entrepreneurial. 
I don't want to steal Congressman Hoyer's uh, thunder, but I got to congratulate University of Maryland for winning our solar uh, cities, our Solar America competition. Uh, tremendous innovation. Sure. Hi, uh, Hi, my name is Chandra Brown. I'm with um, United Streetcar and Oregon Ironworks, and we are huge believers in that we have the most productive workforce, and it's incredible um, what they are doing every day. But some of the things that I think really hits with this training issue, and part of this, I, I also sit on the U.S. Manufacturing Council, very proud to do that and help serve from some of these national issues, it's that we don't have a national manufacturing plan, and I give such huge kudos to this administration who has finally brought some much-needed attention to manufacturing. I'm a huge believer that it is the future of our middle class. I mean, that is what we need to do. We pay our folks, you know, 20 to, you know, $50 an hour, basically. Obviously, we got some folks from the union here as well. We have a union shop, too. But the reality is, it, it is what the future is based on. And we are hiring, there's probably tens of thousands of open manufacturing jobs right now. Why aren't they being filled? because they, it's a branding issue, I actually believe. Like, people don't realize these are great jobs. These are highly skilled jobs. No offense, you don't have to be a PhD scientist right now to get a job in this country. I'm looking for welders and fitters. Why do I have to go overseas to find yes. those? You know, the reality is we need to have a national campaign that says manufacturing are great jobs. You can retire. You can buy a house. You can do all this great work. And I just wish that was out there more because because our problem is the pipeline. Where are the young students coming into manufacturing? Uh, are any of you involved in our science, technology, engineering, and yes, mathematics STEM campaigns, the STEM efforts? Here's the reason why I raised that question. Uh, this is going to sound a little silly, but I'll just say it anyway. It's STEM is sort of an abbreviation, but it's really SM and ET. <laughs> because science and math is kind of in the official curriculums, but, but ET, the engineering and the technology, is sort of VOTAC all the way through to IT in the most advanced ways. So one of the opportunities, I hope, is that as we continue, we have over 100 CEOs in the US who are sort of part of this multi, over $500 million of private commitments, not, not taxpayer commitments, to, to basically propagate best practices on STEM education throughout the country. An opportunity, given what you've said, is what you've said about welders and the others, that's part of STEM too. You don't have to get a PhD in physics or be a Nobel Prize winning cabinet secretary to be, to be aspiring in STEM. It literally is Dale's you know, hackers who come around who want to just sort of tinker and play. It's what I would previously have been called career and technical education that get training in, 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 in the education. It would be very interesting to know whether or not the STEM initiatives already are meeting your needs or whether there's a chance to do more. For example, I always uh, hesitate to ask because I'm going to guess the answer is no again. But uh, we announced a very interesting collaboration with the MacArthur Foundation called Badges for Manufacturing Skills. The idea was, uh, it's a $2 million competition for startups or professors or whomever to create an alternative credentialing system built on gaming. So that if you can open up, if you achieve certain skills, you open up the next level, you open up the next level, you earn badges the way we used to, you know, Boy Scouts and all that. And those badges are carried <coughs> with us when we apply to uh, jobs because you know you don't often need to show that you got a PhD in physics as I said to get that twenty dollar an hour job so the uh, and this was done with NAM uh, I believe in collaboration the National Association of Manufacturers anybody involved in that badges skills credentialing project it's happening live right now anybody at all Bueller Bueller okay so we need to make sure that all of you can participate because literally tomorrow you could call up your local tech councils in southeastern Pennsylvania in uh, uh, Jupiter uh, in Florida uh, or, 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 uh, or the Kennedy Space Center and actually get folks to build these tools so that you can take advantage of this, get them to, to start tinkering if you're interested. I mean, you don't have to do any of this, but we would be delighted and we should put that on our list. That sounds like a good thing. Who's keeping notes of our list? We are keeping <laughs> notes. <laughs> Uh, David Sisley, uh, <coughs> from Rhode Island, and I thank you for convening this conversation. And uh, many of us have been working very hard on a, a Make It in America agenda, which actually begins with the development of a national manufacturing strategy so that we really have benchmarks and can really hold ourselves accountable. And I think, uh, from, from my perspective, we have to invest in all the things we're talking about, job training and infrastructure and uh, being certain that we're investing in innovation and training entrepreneurs. But I would 
I feel like I'm neglecting an opportunity when anytime I talk to administration officials to also say we also have to, and I realize it's probably not anybody's responsibility on this panel, but <coughs> to your counterparts, it's also really important that we figure out a way to better protect the intellectual property that gets developed in this country. Because for those of us that are fighting for investments in education and infrastructure and innovation and for businesses and manufacturers that are willing to do it, if at the end of the process it's just stolen, we haven't protected that investment. And there are business consequences to that, and there are consequences in terms of our public policy. And, you know, we've not done a great job of protecting American businesses and their intellectual property. And the only way we're going to increase manufacturing jobs is to increase international markets because productivity and technology are making the jobs less and less. The only way to counter that is widely opening the marketplace. But if every time we go into a new market, the intellectual property is stolen, it puts American manufacturers at a real disadvantage. So I would just think it's a really important thing I have on our agenda. How do we protect all that we're investing and in, all the great people around this table are generating in terms of new ideas and new technologies and new products? Uh, we have an IP enforcement coordinator at the White House who every day she wakes up in the morning, goes to bed at night protecting our interests abroad, uh, Victoria Espinel. And we will make sure that we yep. enact that. Have, have you been engaged in any way on the initiatives that she's launched? To, no. Kit, we we yeah. will make sure we close yeah. that loop. Great. Audrey. Yes, um, I would like to add another dimension on this and, and adding to the IP. I was uh, actually visiting a, a battery manufacturer in China yes, last week, and the first part of the tour was the R&D work what they were doing, which was reverse engineering a number of American batteries. So it's, it's a real issue. And we're in the uh, software space, and adding to that as dimension is the ability to move forward on IP protection really helps us because we have opportunities abroad that I'm worried about taking advantage of simply because I'm worried about protecting our IP. But to uh, talk about sort of adding to this dimension of the manufacturing is also thinking about the market structure. So what we do is we help large customers of uh, energy actually take their ability to control use, whether it's through clean distributed resources or lighting controls, and actually sell it back as, as virtual power to the grid. So it helps them reduce their oh, electric wow. price but also helps support the grid. And then for us, it creates that market for all these resources. So abroad, folks are looking at smart cities, mm -hmm. how to change the infrastructure. In the US, we don't have a consistent approach. And so one of the things that I think the administration could help us with greatly is thinking about what are we going to do from a market structure and an, invest and an incentive structure, not in terms of incentives as sort of tax breaks, but what do we need to do so that Jim could sell more lights because somebody can say, well, if I put in this expensive light, I'm going to help reduce the cost of energy and I'm going to get paid for it. And suddenly you created this huge market that sits at the customer location that helps keep the grid more balanced but also creates greater efficiency. <coughs> so a couple things that we've run across in, in some of our projects is we're working a lot with the military. They're very interested in putting in microgrids for security bases as also as for economic efficiency. We can sell their unused energy back to the grid. The problem they have is, is that they can't keep those revenues. And so we can create this wonderful self-funded problem. And that's the same problem that everyone in government has. If we can have a, 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 just a change in the appropriations that says if you invest in efficiency, you make money from the power grid and helping reduce your energy costs, you can use those monies to increase what you're doing at these bases. And that's, that's, and you could do it in, in any federal building. That's one area. The other area that we've run into, which to me is another market structure issue that the, we could look at as a federal government, is there are numerous, as you know, commercial buildings that are REITs. Their biggest problem right now is, is that they don't, they don't pay for the electric price. They pass it on to their tenants. So if they, in, to invest in lighting, they don't get the value and they can't take the tax, credit, the tax deduction. So we have to think about how do we get these building, commercial building owners throughout our cities to think about how they can create, get a tax incentive so they can put in these lights and see the value themselves. And the tenants get the value, too, because they're reducing their electric prices. So I think for us to generate a, a huge manufacturing sector, it's also important that we look upstream and see what are of our, our market structures that are getting in our way that may be elsewhere in the world that they're taking care of. And we just haven't been able to get there because of the way we, we approach energy in the country. I, I want to thank you for those comments. Uh, uh, I, 
I also, also I want to say right now, uh, I'm looking at Colin Bishop, who I've worked with for a number of years, and thank the uh, Clean Economy Development Center for the work they've done in bringing all of you here. I, I think most of you have gotten to know Colin uh, through this opportunity, whose who's enthusiasm and hard work is tremendous. But I want to thank you, Audrey, for your comments. I spend uh, 24 hours a day, it is my job, to try to, to increase energy efficiency and reduce energy use in business. You know, and I, I like using an analogy. Uh, if you like to cook, and you need a pound of something, uh, if you want to think how inefficient our buildings are, you'd have to go out and buy a pound and a half of it and throw the, the, half, the extra half pound away. And nobody's going to do that. And yet we do that every single day in virtually every building in America. So thank you for what you're doing, and, and we are excited to work with you in every way. Gil, I'd like to uh, comment yeah. on Audrey's um, very fine recommendation. Uh, to put it into context, I'm Scott Samuelson, the director of the National Fuel Cell Research Center which was established by the Department of Energy in 1998, actually with uh, John Bryson as a principal right. uh, contributor <laughs> right. at that time. And the context is to uh, affirm the important area of this energy systems optimization, the training associated with it, uh, what an area of distributed generation that uh, Veridity is very much uh, engaged in. Uh, one of the common denominators, though, for all of us here could very well be uh, the fuel cell in the future. Uh, it is a goal of the center, as instructed by the Department of Energy, to accelerate the development and deployment of uh, fuel cell technology. So the center works very closely with industry, uh, and the applications are evolving from uh, laptop computers, so replacing the battery that uh, we just referred to, uh, Audrey, to uh, distributed generation in buildings and in homes, probably like the PC in the future. Uh, to uh, automobiles, of course, but also buses for the uh, Department of Transportation, uh, uh, ships, uh, airplanes. So it's a transformational uh, technology. Uh, over the last 10 years, it's evolved to where we now have uh, over 30 megawatts of uh, stationary fuel cell product deployed in California with U.S. manufacturing. With U.S. manufacturing, there's now approaching 100 megawatts deployed in uh, Korea of a uh, U.S. Uh, product. And so we're over the tipping point of the commercialization of stationary fuel cells in the 5 kilowatt to maybe 5 megawatt uh, area. Uh, a lot of technology development is going on with respect to locomotive uh, powering to uh, central plants in the future, uh, 100, 200, 300 uh, megawatt. On the mobile side, for automobiles, we, I think, have heard of the expectation of the commercialization in 2015 by major manufacturers of the automobile in the U.S., again, fuel cells. So it's a transformational technology that goes from powering a pacemaker in the heart to, uh, to central plant. Uh, U.S. has a leadership in this area today, and it's a training opportunity is the reason it comes to mind, of uh, being able to have a uh, activity of focus in this area because of the per pervasive uh, role it's going to play in uh, products, uh, from sports products to uh, uh, distributed generation to central power generation. That's tremendous. Sure. Uh, I'm coming from an educational perspective. I teach third grade. And I um, know that um, the goal of schools now is to get every child to college. And I was listening to this lady's discussion about manufacturing and how we don't have the skilled people to do the manufacturing. And in um, my school district, they have eliminated all the welding and all the auto shop and all the those kinds of jobs, carpentry. They've eliminated those jobs. And they their goal is to get every child to college. And every child isn't bid to go to college. And I teach third grade. And I have children who want to build things and want to do those kinds of things. And that's what they need to be <coughs> trained in. And I think that we need to have an educational perspective here that some education is to teach these people how to become manufacturers. And so we need to do that. Um, I think that that would be a benefit to our, our high school and, and middle school uh, programs. I know we have the STEM program, and that's for the technolo technology students. But that's not for the uh, auto repair person or for the... I just want to make one... I, 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 that's my <coughs> concern about the misnomer of a lot of the STEM programs. For example, I'm an Arlington Virginian. 
our STEM program is the auto mechanics have more computing power in the car than we did in a mm -hmm. space shuttle. Mm -hmm. So uh, those <clears throat> folks are actually trained in the what we would traditionally have called Votech <coughs> in Arlington, and uh, they're trained at the intersection of the computers. I mean, the, the, the manuals themselves require a knowledge of IT. So uh, I'm anxious to hear your story about the reduction in these sort of um, career and technical education resources. The president has always been clear, we don't represent anyone from education here, but just to reflect on at least the priorities as he's outlined, it's never been the four-year college only as the goal. He's always referenced higher education and related uh, credentials and skills for, in many cases, these manufacturing. That's what this badges program, in a sense, was designed for, was that credentialing mechanism so folks can be trained. Um, it is important to hear the story that you said about yeah, the challenges in your district. We should Let me just jump in for a second. And I don't think I'm it's only my district. I'm uh, Fatah from Philadelphia. This month's Poplar Mechanic Magazine features a high school in Philadelphia, West Philly High, kids making automobiles uh, as part of the X Prize competition. Mm -hmm. And that's a STEM program, but it is in the, in the vein, I think, that you mean, which is that it really attracts young people who want to tinker and build things. Robotic programs uh, work in the same way. But I hear you. Uh, about the need for us to make sure that at the K to 12 level, we don't, especially at the high school level, don't close out uh, some of the uh, vocational ed programs uh, that would. That's uh, what I'm talking Create about. the yeah. opportunity for I'm young people about to become the student who isn't the straight A academic yeah. student who qualifies for the STEM Absolutely. program and who's doing physics and who's doing uh, I, I, chemistry and who's doing advanced mathematics. I'm talking about the regular student who yeah. we're losing in high school. <clears throat> If I'm you look agreeing at with you because I took the Secretary of Commerce down to Penn Fish and Tackle in North Philadelphia. Across the street, they were hiring kids right out of Dobbins Vocational High School for decades. And the school district had decided to rearrange the vocational ed and it stopped the flow of uh, workers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into the plant. So we do need to have a common sense and approach. I, and I think we can look at the trades and have the trades sponsor some of those programs also. You know, the, the, uh, the pipe fitters union and the electricians union could be sponsoring those because certainly we're going to have a need for those. And I see a lot of our, our people who are working in those fields now coming from foreign countries, not coming from this country. Don, you should weigh in on this. Uh, Don LaForest, UAW Local 22. Uh, General Motors employee. Uh, we make the uh, groundbreaking <coughs> Volt electric car mm -hmm. and the Opel Impera that we are exporting to Europe. An American car company exporting a car. Uh, our car gets 35 to 50 miles on electric charge, and yet, what good is a car that makes that gets 35 to 50 miles only? Well, our our vehicle after the it reaches the 50 mile range. Uh, a battery. We have a, a, a gasoline engine that seamlessly kicks on to, to take you as far as you need to go. Uh, the, what we would need from uh, government is infrastructure to uh, be able to plug these vehicles in at malls and schools and wh wherever you go and drive. Don, you've hit on a really good point because the, the infrastructure for sustainable transportation is uh, an important part of what we need to do. We have first tried to set the framework through, for example, CAFE standards, fuel economy standards that go out to 2025 with the Environmental Protection Agency. So for the first time, U.S. manufacturers can have the kind of certainty and predictability they need to make the kind of investment decisions for sustainable uh, vehicles for transportation. Uh, we have to change everything from local electrical and building codes for, for charging stations uh, to federal prohibitions on having charging stations <coughs> and rest areas along interstates. Uh, and we're doing that right now, and we have some pilot uh, projects to do that uh, because the infrastructure has to be there uh, to support it. Uh, the same is true of other sustainable transportation, uh, whether it's um, uh, LNG or, or hybrid uh, buses, uh, in the future fuel cell uh, vehicles. Uh, we need to make sure that we're building that sustainable transportation future uh, and as I mentioned in the beginning, we're twinning it with the goal of maximizing American manufacturing by doing it. Uh, we are not going to outsource that kind of technical competence, and instead we're going to use it as a way to recycle those dollars right here in America. Yeah, Congressman. Yep. Yep, right here. 
I'm Rich Krieger. I'm on the Applied Technologies faculty at Wake Technical Community College in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I'm a teacher. I'm an automotive teacher, and I've been someone who's been in an automotive career all my life. We talk about uh, needing job skills for manufacturing. We do. But one of the cornerstones of the success of the American automobile manufacturers has been the fact that for decades, uh, a Chevy owner who lived in the smallest town or village in the United States could get the car fixed at the local repair shop. And that ensured the success of those vehicles. Now, we are talking about implementing entirely new technologies, heavily, heavily computerized. The vehicles are, 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 are traveling networks yes, of computers. Yes, we are talking about having to deal with a whole new type of technology, electric motors, high voltage systems, fuel cells. The training model that we are using for internal combustion engines has been okay, but it's not good enough to train a core of technicians to service these vehicles in time for their industrial production level. If you want the American consumer to buy a Volt, they've got to be able to get it fixed, regardless of where they live. And our training model is not up to that. More importantly, and I brought two automotive students with me today, I want these two people to have a successful career, hopefully at least as successful as mine has been. But in my career, I have seen technician wages go from about 45% of a shop's hourly charge, which, is, which was the norm when I was working in, the, in that field, to 10% today. And yet, the shop hourly charges have more than doubled in the last few decades. But in that same time that shop charges have doubled, technician wages have dropped. And, and how, how do I convince these very bright individuals to spend their career in automotive service if I can't tell them that they can earn a comfortable living? It's a, it's a very serious <coughs> issue, and it's not being, in my opinion, not being addressed. And it needs to be addressed at, <coughs> at this level. If I might, uh, I'm John Garamendi. I'm a member of Congress from California. Yes. And, uh, Mr. Rasmussen. I have the pleasure of representing you, and congratulations on being the Teacher of the Year in Fairfield. Hey. For my school, not for my district. Yeah, I chose you're not. You're still good enough. It's still good. Yeah. Yeah. You should still be I celebrating. Cho I chose not to pursue that. Nonetheless, <laughs> you've raised a very, very important question here, and that has to do with this training, and, and it's been going around the table. Uh, I'm going to be very, very frank. The U.S. Congress isn't going to get a damn thing done this year, and there's not going to be much money. And so for those members of the uh, administration who are here, when your president says we can't wait, that's correct. We can't wait. And there are things that you can do and you ought to do uh, to move these things along. The STEM education is terrific. But I've got to tell you, the technical education is just as important, if not more important. You've heard it at least from three different people here. And you can do things about that. The No Child Left Behind is essentially a college education program. Okay. But that's not where most are going to go. And so you need to deal with that. The President has the ability to radically change the purchasing power of the U.S. government. You heard over here about lights. You can do it like that. One executive order and you can change out the lights in this entire federal organizational structure. You can do, you can do purchasing. You want to buy electric cars? It can be done by the President. We can't wait. The President has the power to make many, many of the changes you're going to hear here. I wish Congress would do it, but it isn't going to happen. Uh, you know, we can go into that. Mr. Hoyer is here, and we can talk about it for link. But the fact of the matter is the United States Congress isn't going to get a damn thing done, isn't going to create a jobs program, is going to do everything they can to destroy things. And we're going to have to do things at the executive level, so we can't wait. The power is in your hands. I really want to commend the Department of Transportation. I have a bill that says it's going to buy American. You said it's not necessary because you can do it, and you are doing it. Thank you for doing it. You're simply not granting waivers. Thank you. Hopefully, you're going to be there 15 months from now. But if you're not there, then we need a law. But thank you. You're making a big change. Siemens has built a factory in Sacramento because you didn't grant a waiver to import locomotives and light rail. You got a manufacturing plant in Oregon because you didn't grant a waiver. It's in your hands. We really urge you to take every action. 
because this nation can't wait, and you do have the power to make the changes. Congressman, you're absolutely right. And as I mentioned before, we are simply not granting waivers. And uh, um, if you uh, want to watch that in action, the way the waiver process works is it's published in the Federal Register, a waiver request. Um, but you don't need to hire a lobbyist anymore to find out what we're up to. It's on our website, dot.gov. Click on Buy America. You can sign up. If there's a waiver request, we send you an email alert. Now, you're not going to get many emails from us. Just say no. <laughs> good. Oh, go ahead. I would just like to um, completely echo that and say, you know, that is why we are partly in existence today is because of the Made in America laws and why we have hundreds of workers right now building. We built the first modern streetcar in 58 years in the United States. We are insourcing jobs. We've taken jobs from Europe and brought them back to the United States. And thanks to the help of the Federal Transit Administration, some grants, we're working on a U.S. propulsion system so the content of our car could be roughly 90% made in the U.S. So I absolutely believe these things be made in the U.S. My few comments, and why I want to say how great and how much I appreciate this, is because one of the greatest things this administration has done is worked across the fields. It's something that we haven't seen. So when I have energy here and we have transportation here and commerce here, that's great. And some of the messages I would like to get across is transportation has led the way in Buy America. They have been outstanding. But even transportation, who is my favorite and done such a great job, I have this list here of like five different Buy America rules and regulations. It's like, yeah, I'd like to see everything be at least 60%, if not tighten. But you know what? We just lost a bridge to China due to some of these rules that's now being built there that we would have built domestically in our shop. And so I, I would love to see one, I mean, transportation's led the way, a standardization, whether it's the Recovery Act language, that should be in everything. That should be in the super committee. We've done it energy. Let's take energy, for example. Energy has no Buy America requirements until ARA came along. And ARA changed that. People said it can't be done. You know what? It was done. And that's created a huge amount of energy jobs all across this country. Why can't what transportation, and why can't there be an overarching, you know, Buy America, if you're using our federal taxpayer I don't care what group you're in, <laughs> you know, why can't that be done? So when we have you all here talk about legislation and regulatory reform that we all agree on, transportation's leading the way. I think they could even standardize it. I think it could be across energy and commerce, and I don't know how to make that happen. How about the Department of Defense, well, the Hellfire say. missile yeah, fuel DOD. is made in China. So that's just my, well, if, if is, anything In addition to whether or not we have a law or not, um, there are things that can be done. And, you know, I, in the Energy Department Appropriations Bill this year, we, gonna, we have language that will require the department to identify all of, through all of its uh, suppliers, items that are not now made in America so that we can have a list. And, um, and we're funding a program through the Department of Commerce, uh, uh, $5 million, so that we can communicate that information to these 30,000 manufacturers because part of it is in the information flow. It's not just a requirement that something be made. We need to have the ability to have some of our manufacturers, uh, you know, chop at the bit to make it uh, so that we can meet uh, what Lita Hoyer calls the Make It in America goal. So it's not just the, the legal requirement, but it's the information about what the items that need to be domestically produced that are not now domestically produced that our government needs uh, throughout the various <coughs> agencies. And that's another example of where we can do it by law. We can also do it by executive order. Can we engage Dale a little yeah. bit? Uh, you're, you're, you're sort of in the an, the anti-Washington message yeah, in the sense that true. you guys just hang out and do great stuff. Can yeah. you share your story? Sure. Um, uh, I'm Dale Doherty, and, and I, I started this magazine called Make, and it's, it's sort of a 21st century popular mechanics. Um, and it really meant to, to describe how to make things, uh, you know, for fun and, and play. and. Uh, started an event called Maker Fair, just uh, bringing people together to see what they make in their basements and garages, and what are they doing with technology, and, and uh, you know, it really kind of came from the technology side into what you might call manufacturing, uh, but people are building robots, people are building, you know, new forms of lighting, new forms of the things that, you know, that, that it's just on their, in their head to do this, and you mentioned tinkering, and now, tinkering was once really a solid middle-class skill. You know, it was, it was how you made your life better. 
you, know, you, bet, you got a better home, you fixed your car, you did a lot of things. So we've kind of lost some of that. And, and it's kind of on the fringe instead of in the middle uh, today. And, and I, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, but, but something coming from, I think, some of the software community is influencing manufacturing today, new ways of thinking about this. <laughs> Um, you know, and it's almost, it's a culture. It, it, I think when you look at Make and Maker Faire, this is a new culture, and it is a way to kind of redefine what this means. And so the elements of that culture is openness. You know, share what you're doing, um, get out there, see what other people are doing. Um, I, I, I just a, sort of in, a, a willingness around risk that, you know, hey, you fail, so what? Get up and do it again. Um, uh, uh, creative. Um, behind this is, and this, I think, really changes it to see things like manufacturing as a creative enterprise, not something, you know, where, where you're told to do something, but where, you, where you're invited to solve a problem or, or figure things out. And then, if, you know, lastly, personal. You know, it's like people are building robots because they want to. It, it, it's a, an expression of who they are and what they love to do. And so when you get these people together, they really turn each other on and they turn on you know, uh, other people, we do Maker Faire in California, in, in the San Mateo area, uh, outside of San Francisco. We do it in Michigan, in, in Dearborn, and Henry Ford Museum. And we do it in New York at the uh, Queens Hall of Science. Plus, there are, there are about 25 uh, smaller Maker Faires around the country. But... Uh, yeah, can you describe the scale of this? Yeah. Maybe uh, know how many folks in, in California, we have about 100,000 people coming to the fair. Um, you know, these are families, and they're small kids. <laughs> And what excites me is, 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 Bruce, what you're saying, is kids want to do this. You know, they really want to do it. And they, you know, I, I, I would say, agree with you that often, and I don't think it has to do with just, I think the welders have a lot in common with the kids that want to do electronics. You know, they actually get together and say, you know, I need that body of that robot welded, and you know how to do the controller, so let's work together on this. But, you know, uh, you know the, these, we got a lot of kids that don't want to sit in a seat and, and read a textbook, mm -hmm. and they want to do stuff. And <coughs> how do we, you know, just unleash that power, uh, you know, to give them the opportunity to, to engage with, with what they want to do? I also want to inter interject. Um, my school is a state-of-the-art school. We're, we're a smart board certified school. Smart boards are made in Canada, by the way. I, I don't know why they can't be made in the United States. A smart board is an interactive work board. Yeah. And our school, each teacher has a, a Elmo data projector, and each teacher has a document camera, and each teacher has a computer. Unfortunately, our computers are seven years old. The technology now is so much more superior than the technology of seven years ago. And so we're using computers that take 20 to 30 minutes to start because the software on them takes so long. The teachers are all using these, uh, this technology. We need to put that technology in the students' hands. We need to have each student working with that technology. And we don't have the funding to do that. And unfortunately, in our times, education is cut back. We've gone from 20 students to 32 students in a classroom. And um, we certainly are trying our best to do our job but with additional technology and computer labs and and those kinds of things, it certainly would motivate those students to become high quality, productive adults. And that's our goal as an educator. That's my goal. I've done it for 33 years. I, I can see we could, we, this conversation could go well beyond the allotted time. And I want to make uh, sure that we have time at the, at the end for uh, our, our incredibly distinguished visitor here and leader Hoyer. Uh, to make some comments, but let me, uh, John. Uh, I, just really a super quick uh, observation, and I think it's a cautionary note for all of us. Uh, I grew up in Kokomo, Indiana. The motto is city of first, automotive city. Dad's a retired UAW guy. But, you know, it, it strikes me that in America, you know, we always have to be concerned about the uh, law of unintended consequences. And we look at this whole discussion about STEM education, as if it's separate and apart from education. And I think we have to be careful that we don't make something, we, we put this notion of science and technology and all these kinds of educational tools up here on this high pedestal. And we even, we, Anish, you and I have talked about this in terms of the innovation agenda. We make it sound like it's something that's way up here, separate and apart from you know, the rest of the you know, quote average people. 
we got to find a way to make sure that everybody sees their future in all of this. Yeah. And we just have to be careful yeah. that we don't put these things out there as such a unique, separate thing that a huge percentage of our children think, well, that's not me. I, you know, that's, that's STEM. That's for all these, you know, crazy smart people. <laughs> you know, we've got to find a way to integrate all of this. It goes to your point about branding and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just so that everybody sees that they're all part of this. And we've got to figure out how to bring that same kind of education and understanding of math, science, technology, all these things to, you know, no matter where you are in the station. Sorry. Well, we, will, we will definitely have time to continue this conversation, but I do want to turn over to Leader Hoyer, who, who's uh, incredible career in the Congress and, and leadership in innovation and entrepreneurship in America. So thank you for being here this morning and uh, <coughs> look forward to hearing your remarks. Well, Gil, thank you very much. Ms. Secretary, thank you as well. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with all of you. Uh, and this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Uh, Chandra Brown and I were on a panel uh, about two, three months ago, I guess, uh, maybe a little longer ago than that, and talking about the agenda, and I'm sure uh, Chaka Fatah, John Garamani, and David Cicilline have already talked about the, what we call our Make It in America agenda. The Secretary just mentioned something, that we have to get this in a context where young people are going to get excited about this and, and adults are going to get excited about it. And when you do polling data, uh, and you start talking about Make It in America or Made in America, it gets the most positive response of any poll data in terms of reigniting the American dream. The American dream, when you read these polls of people who think we're on the wrong track, uh, and they're fearful, and they're anxious, and the anxiety shows, it shows and it manifests itself in an awful lot of ways that we see. And we do, in fact, have to reignite this sense that the American dream is still alive. Uh, this ladder of opportunity that we talk about, they want to make sure that the bottom ten rungs have not disappeared. And the only rungs on the ladder of opportunity are at the very top. Uh, and that's what Make It in America is about, this concept, uh, which is obviously two or threefold. Let me give you, first of all, Make It. High five. We won the game. We aced the test. We got the job. Make it. You know, we made it. Uh, the president, in his uh, presentation of the jobs uh, bill, talked about make it in America and made in America. Same thing. Uh, my view is made in America has sort of one meaning. Uh, make it in America has that meaning of success, grabbing opportunity, and, but also making it in America. And growing it in America and selling it here and around the world. Uh, and the concept that we can make it here in America. Uh, you mentioned the fact, or somebody mentioned the fact, why can't we make this, that, or the other in America? Jackie Spear, who's a member of Congress uh, from California, gave me a hat not too long ago. It was a pink hat. I thought she was giving me the hat because uh, uh, breast uh, cancer awareness, because it was that pink. She said, no, 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 look at the hat. So I looked, and she said, look at the label. Designed in America. Designed in America. She said, flip it over. And on the other side of designed in America is made in China. Now, there's no reason why we don't have people who can make a lot of hats in America. Uh, very frankly, I was at uh, the Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, <coughs> memorial dedication. Tommy Hilfiger was a, is, played a big part in that. He's got wonderful clothes, et cetera, et cetera. Gave a lot of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. hats out. Made in China. Uh, we have to get the psychology of making it in America so that it can then, Chandra, be translated to a policy of make it in America. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do in the Congress of the United States. John Garamani has been on the floor. Chaka, David Cicilline has a bill, Make It in America. Uh, Andrew Liveris, I don't know how many of you know Andrew Liveris. He's the president and CEO of uh, Dow Chemical Company. He's written a book. He wrote it seven months after we came up with Make It in America, and he called it Make It in America. I am not suing him for copyright infringement <laughs> because I want everybody to be talking about Make It in America. I want us to have that integrated
concept of make it in America, where success is translated to making it in, in America. And the concept that there is no reason. BMW makes its SUVs in America and sells them where? Berlin, Rome, London, etc., etc. I presume Tokyo as well. And they're now if they can do it, if BMW can come to the United States of America and make SUVs and sell them around the world, there is no reason why we can't do the same. And in fact, I talked to the CFO of GE just the other day who was in my office, talked about bringing jobs back to America. But also making sure that those things that we can make in America, Chandra, we, we spend tax dollars in doing just that. John has been... I upset somebody, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> He's giving you an amen. That's a, that's a, that's a, that, that was an amen yes, you heard? That's what I, that's what I heard. <laughs> this is my translator to my yes, left. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> we have a, a list of bills. Uh, John is right. We're all frustrated. Uh, we're not moving on legislation in the Congress of the United States. Uh, it's, it's a tragedy. Uh, it's a tragedy that uh, uh, we are pretending uh, to wait uh, for the next election. Let me tell you, I'm very distressed that Mr. Papandreou, who had a deal, said, let's put it on referendum. The American people cannot afford to wait. The restoration of American confidence in our ability to expand uh, our economy and grow our jobs cannot wait. John Garamendi is right. Whatever we can do through the administration now, we need to be doing. Uh, not 14 months from now. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here uh, with all of you. Polls show that 50 percent of Americans feel the American dream is slipping away. And one of the reasons they feel it's slipping away is because they don't see the jobs available. We've lost 9 million manufacturing jobs out of about 20 million manufacturing jobs over the last 20 years. America still makes more products than any nation on earth. We're still number one. Uh, but because we were number one, we have rested on our laurels. We cannot afford to do that. So we have to re-energize with a Make It in America agenda coming from the administration, coming from the Congress, but more importantly, coming from all of you. So that Chandra and I had a discussion about, you know, I'm making things here in America, but if you're spending tax dollars and not buying what I'm making, I'm not going to be in business. The American government's the biggest purchaser in the world of goods and services. And the American taxpayers earn hard-earned dollars. And we need to put those hard-earned dollars, uh, and, and by the way, I want to make it clear, I'm not a protectionist. I believe we can compete with any nation on earth. I voted for all three trade bills, understand me. We can compete with anybody in the world with the quality of workers that we have. Now, we have to do it in a broad way. We have to focus on education. Yes, there's some kids uh, we want to get, get, get in college. <coughs> now, I want to also convince everybody in the world, particularly the brightest, smartest people in the world, they can make it in America. Forty percent of our Nobel Prize winners are foreign-born. Of America's, over time, 40 percent are foreign-born. I want young people to come here and go to MIT, Georgia Tech, University of Maryland, uh, now, if you can't get in the University of Maryland, they can go to MIT and Georgia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> right? There you go. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I want them to come here, and then I want them to feel that they can make it in America and stay here in America and help us make it. That has been our uh, experience in the past, and that can be our experience in the future. So I'm very pleased that the White House has uh, uh, convened this conference. I'm more pleased that all of you are here, because what we need in the Congress uh, is your ideas of how we can facilitate young people thinking, I can be a welder and I can make $22, hour, $22 an hour plus benefits. I go around to all these small manufacturers and they say, we can't get welders. You know, but we're not telling high school kids, hey, you want a really good life and be able to support your uh, uh, child? And, 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 and wife and children, and, or, or you can support your husband, or you and your husband together can have a wonderful life. <coughs> Welders, electricians, plumbers, carpenters, 
all sorts of people who make things with their hands. Uh, you were talking about, uh, uh, you know, making things. Uh, it's a wonderful concept. We want to translate that into legislation, but we also want to translate it into the psychology in America that we're going to make it, that we're going to be better tomorrow than we are today. They don't believe that right now. We need to reinstill that confidence uh, in them and have an agenda that has a concept of success, of the American dream being vibrant, that we're reigniting, that we're expanding it. Uh, and if we do that, uh, we're going to have the kind of success in the decade and, and, and decades to come uh, that America needs and wants. John, you want me to yield to you, I can uh, tell. Yesterday we were on the floor uh, talking about making it in America, and Jan Tchaikovsky of uh, Illinois uh, said something, and you go, an oh wow moment. She brought to us <coughs> the following thing. She said, in the first days of Washington, George Washington's first presidency, the very first days, he ordered Alexander Hamilton to develop a Make It in America agenda. And Hamilton came up with 11 <coughs> points about how America can make it. And for his inaugural, Washington wanted, sent his people out to find a suit that was made in America. So this is not a new thing. And I go, <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. From the very beginning of this country, an industrial policy. It's not a new thing. I'm a Baptist, as you may uh, be able to glean from my passionate uh, presentation. Uh, but every once in a while, I believe you need revival. You need revival in business. You need revival. In, you need to get a sense that uh, that objective that you had, that you sort of took ho-hum attitude towards as time went by, you've got to renew your commitment and passion to accomplish that objective. America is the greatest innovator, inventor, and developer on the face of the earth. But Andy Grove and Andrew Liveris will both tell you, if we continue to take things to scale that we <coughs> invent, innovate, and develop, and we take them to scale overseas, mm -hmm. our inventors, innovators, and developers will migrate with the product. We cannot afford as a nation not to make it in America. Because if we're going to succeed in this century, it will be because we continue to be the center of innovation, invention, and development of great products. I, I, I use the story. I bought my uh, grandson a Kindle about 18 months ago, or two, two years ago now, uh, Christmas. Kindle. I think I paid 160 170 I'm not sure exactly what I paid for it. Uh, about 25 or 30 bucks of a product invented here, innovation, developed here. About 25 to 30 dollars was U.S. value added in that product. Now we're not going to be able to provide the kinds of jobs our people need, our economy needs, and our country needs if we don't make it in America. So I want to thank all of you who do just that and who are thinking about how do we encourage young people to make things? How do we encourage companies to stay here? We have an advantage now. <coughs> I talked to the National Association of Manufacturers about this. They're telling me that while salaries used to be the determining factor on siting, as I said, I met with the CFO GE, that is no longer the case. For one thing, it's very expensive to send products home from wherever you're making them around the world because transportation costs have increased substantially. And while it may make uh, sense uh, to make a product in China that you're going to sell in China, uh, it makes a equal, if not more sense, products you're going to sell here in America, make them here in America, save that uh, price, give Americans uh, good jobs, and access the skill sets that we have in this country. So thank you all, and thank you. Uh, I want to thank the White House for uh, having this forum uh, and for giving us energy. Uh, I have urged the White House. I would hope you would as well. I'll make another lobbying effort here. We had uh, somebody who was the head of manufacturing policy, Ron Bloom. He just recently uh, uh, stepped down. Uh, but uh, I want to have that as an office that is highlighted. I will tell the White House and, and the executive, <coughs> highlighted so that Americans <coughs> get it, that we are focused on this as an agenda, not just as a temporary political agenda, but as a long-term strategy for the uh, United States of America to have, as so many of our competitors have, a manufacturing policy, a policy directed at making it here and expanding the job opportunities that it will create. 
manufacturing leverages more jobs than any other enterprise we do uh, in, in America. Uh, that's why the automobile uh, manufacturing, saving the automobile manufacturing was so very important. There were some critical of it. We saved not only a great manu some great manufacturing capabilities, which enhanced our national security, but we also saved <coughs> hundreds of thousands of jobs in the automobile industry, but millions of jobs in ancillary services supplying, servicing uh, the automobile industry. Your ideas are critical. Let us have them. Uh, we'll act on them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Thank you. We, we Might will, I add, excuse me. We're, we're going to have opportunity to, to continue uh, lots of conversation, but I want to clear with uh, our schedules uh, that we're, we're good. We're good. We can continue. Okay. And their pensions. A few more minutes. Yes, yeah, saved their go. pensions. Sure, yeah. Don. I just wanted to add, he saved their <coughs> By doing that, you saved the pensions, too. We, we, we positively affected hundreds of thousands of lives directly. I, let me make a comment here. Everybody is focused on the NBA and the players and the owners. Those are not the people who are going to pay the price. It's going to be the vendors. It's going to be the ushers. It's going to be the uh, parking attendants. They're the ones who are going to pay the price. And so when you point out pensions, we got a lot of people that are involved in this area that we have to make sure have a kind of life in the American dream uh, that they want. Uh, can we, we're going to do a lightning round because we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to say what's on your mind. Uh, we're going to, after we wrap up the official, we'll still continue the dialogue. But for this uh, last several minutes, if we could do a lightning round, not to put you on the spot, young man, but if you wouldn't mind, what would you like to share with us about your story and its implications for the country? Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, sir. Sure. Uh, thank you. It's a... You got a cool name, too. What is, how do you pronounce so, uh, that? Uh, my name is Thibaut Mannequin, and I'm from uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we run a development company called Seawall Development, and our idea was to create something called a Center for Educational Excellence, which provides really smart, well-located apartments for teachers at discounted rents and high-quality office space for education-focused nonprofits. Um, the idea is to roll out the red carpet for the people who we think are doing the most important work in our city and in our country. That's really cool. Awesome. Thank you for that story. You've got some great partnerships, too. You want to say a couple words about that? <coughs> yeah, so we're, we're, uh, we're partnered with Teach for America as uh, one of our partners. Um, they were a part of our first Baltimore project, and based on the success of that one for their teachers and for their office tenants, they asked us to replicate the model across the country. So we've been hard at work right. at that, working up in Philadelphia, down in New Orleans, and in some other major urban markets to help teachers focus all their energy and attention on the kids and in the classrooms. Let's keep Great. going. The folks Let's go. Jeff, I yeah. haven't heard from you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jeff Lametta. Um, I work for a, a $16 billion global manufacturing services company. Oh, it's a startup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my job is innovation in execution. Okay. One of our partner customers is Lighting Science. Uh, we're working together with Fred Maxick, CTO, uh, for instance, to create a, a, a better way to make the product that, that these guys are designing. My belief is that the more innovation that, that we, we put into products, the, the more jobs we're going to create in America. Um, we, we're doing a lot of this innovation right in Florida, on the other side of the state, in St. Petersburg. So, um, you know, it's very interesting to hear all the comments today. Um, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, um, and the automotive is in my blood. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good to hear this, this, this information about the automotive industry and what's happening there. Um, I'm very interested in some of the programs, especially in how we can, we can create um, um, and work with the government in, in, in creating uh, innovation in manufacturing. Excellent. Great. Rebecca, Hi. our small business person of the year of South Carolina. Oh, thank you. Um, Rebecca Upkiss, UEC Electronics in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm from Detroit area, too. Um, grew up, um, so very familiar with the automobile industry, <coughs> manufacturing, you know, the whole trends of, of that. Um, we. We do design through production. So we are a small company, but our markets are DOD, commercial, industrial, entrepreneurial, where we will do the design, um, take it through prototype production, and we have, you know, full-scale manufacturing uh, facilities in Charleston. Um, 
we also do contract manufacturing, build to print. The concern, the concerns I had that from the conversation we just had is the whole perception of manufacturing. You know, in the schools, we work with the schools, we host tours, we go out and send speakers, trying to involve kids, enlighten kids that this is a career you want. It's not the whole Upton Sinclair, you know, novels of, you know, manufacturing. This is this is new technology. So so we're um, very active there and I think that mindset has to change. I agree with all the comments here. I'm finding this very interesting. The other the other perception that needs to change is the conversation we just had. And that is it just doesn't make sense to make it in America. It's too expensive to make it in America. And from what I mean by that is some of the experiences we've had with our entrepreneurs who come to us with, I have this great idea, I have this patent. We get referrals from SC Launch in, in South Carolina from patent attorneys. Um, we want you to take this idea, make it into a product, commercialize it. And I get excited. Well, that's great. We can take it through design and we can produce it for you. And over 60% of them, we have our patriots, but 60% of them are like, well, no, 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 we're not going to build it here. It won't, we won't be able to sell it. You can't make it at a competitive cost in this country. And they're already thinking and looking for brokers to have their products made in China or Taiwan. And it is depressing, but it's a reality that I think we need to address. And just the mindset that, that it can be done here. And I think the administration and, and other um, groups need to, to work hard to remove barriers for manufacturers, whether it's, you know, you know we're still struggling with the implications of the, aren't you sorry you asked what I thought? Uh, <laughs> the, you know, the health care and the taxes and, and, and everything else for a small company is, is huge. You know, how do we get past that to be cost-effective manufacturers? So, um, I will continue to enjoy this afternoon and um, hearing what, what comes to the table, but, but that's basically um, who we are and what we do. Well, last but not least for this incredible group of champions today, we haven't heard from you, Michael. Oh, hi. Well, good morning. I'm uh, Michael Bowman. I'm from Colorado. I'm a founding uh, board member of 25 by 25, which is a national renewable energy initiative, so I'm a, a rural representative, a rural interest, uh, so I get to to talk about some of the not so sexy things about about uh, but but I think things that are very important uh, and how you build an economy and how we uh, you know, how we make ourselves better and, and part of that is you're know, looking at the uh, you know the, the dependence we have on foreign oil and and, and the, the people that I represent in the rural areas who can who can who can make biofuels and create create an electron from wind and solar and and biomass and and how do we create a sustainable economy. You know, at the very base of the economy, and how do you put a foundation under what we do so that the schools have a tax base so they can afford to you know, hire teachers to teach? And uh, and how do we build local economies? I'm come from a very rural perspective, but we have you know we have incredible market challenges in this country with our with our with our products. As we look at our our liquid fuels, uh, we look at our look at ways to get wind and solar into a system that's basically designed to keep us out. Uh, it takes very good, it takes state policy, it takes national policy. Obviously, we'd like to have a good national policy on this, but in the absence of that, um, I'm very proud of what we've done in Colorado, second only, second only to, uh, to California in our standard. But we've, we've, uh, we've had some great successes because we started putting good state public policy in place seven years ago, uh, which culminated in the GE plant being announced to be, uh, and, and the manufacturing plant coming to Colorado that was just announced two weeks ago. Uh, so we, you know, I think that uh, that we play a really specific role in, in, from the rural perspective, and how we do that. How do we how we affect balance of payments, and how do we, and from a health perspective, uh, we know that the benzene, tylenine, and uh, xylene we're putting in our liquid fuels are causing 200 billion dollars a year in health and indirect and indirect health costs, and, and causing 15,000 premature lives. You know, how do we start taking what we know and what we can do from the EPA's perspective? And getting those out that are the authorizations they have under the Clean Air Act, and start bringing local, you know, local fuels in uh, to fix a health problem. Uh, how do we link up with the the uh, the, the military, in particular, the Department of Defense in Colorado specifically? We have a great opportunity where we're right now working on a project on, on a holistic view of how you build a regional economy with the with what the Department of Defense can do under its authorizations as well, and so. It's right now for us, I think it's taking very, very, very creative ideas at local levels to build that economy so that we can attract the manufacturing in, so that we can incorporate returning veterans uh, into, that, into that economy, and so that we can link agriculture back <coughs> to those urban areas on the front range 
uh, and provide that, that hope and opportunity for rural areas that, that, that need to happen. Uh, the only the, the, the places in uh, rural Colorado where the most exciting things are happening are where there are renewable energy projects being built uh, right now. Uh, and, and it's putting the tax base you know, into a region where there was no tax base before. Incredible stories in Logan County, Colorado, and Lincoln County, Colorado, and Prowers County, Colorado, where their economies and their literally turned around uh, because public policy forced this to happen. And that was the only way it happened. Uh, and, uh, and then build, build a storm around it. But it does take, you know, it takes everyone that sits here today and a few people that aren't. Uh, in our case, you know, with, with EPA and, and DOD and, and USDA, uh, Secretary Vilsack's biomass roadmap, uh, biofuels roadmap, uh, we know that we can put four million people to work uh, that aren't working today by achieving a 25% standard in this country. Uh, we've, we've finished the study. University of Tennessee has done, this, done the studies for us. Uh, just released our latest version of it. Uh, we can, we're here. We can do it, uh, but it's market access. It's, it's how do we, you know, how do we get an open fuel standard? How do we take technology on the engine side and, and uh, accommodate those new fuels in a way that is efficient and uh, and, and creates the jobs here? So. I want to uh, thank everybody for for kicking off this day the way it has. This is, a, if you've noticed, an incredibly great substantive discussion. I mean, we've talked about. Uh, how to better best use government purchasing power. We've talked about education and training needs. We've talked about market transformation and, and the realization that we have to have a broad base. We've talked about clean energy policy and renewable energy and how it drives. We've talked about the need for industrial manufacturing and other policy. And I know I, along with my colleagues, have a, a lengthy list of notes for our dialogue. Uh, we're going to continue uh, after this session. We, we're going to uh, move to, to a little social networking, and then we're going to have a, a break, and then we're going to talk about some substantive specific issues in transportation and lighting as the day goes on. So thank you for a great start, and I look forward to the rest of the day. Great discussion.